morning. Y'all got really quiet once the music stopped. <laughs> um, we are glad that you are here in worship this morning. Um, a few announcements for you. Today, annual conference starts, and so Brad and I and about six other folks from Bethel will be just traveling over to Greenville. We don't have to go very far this year for the next few days to do the work of the annual conference, and so we invite you to be in prayer with us as we do that this week. Um, Also an announcement, we're not doing Wednesday night dinners right now, however, they're still doing games, and so if you want to come and play games at 3, is it 3, Brad, at 3 o'clock in the fellowship hall, board games, card games, um, here's what I'm going to say. It has traditionally been sort of older folks, but they love to have younger folks come. So now in the summer, the kids are out of school. If you want to do this as a family situation, we invite you um, to do that. They would love to have you there um, to play games. And still Jim Pickleball for beginners on Wednesdays, too. So even though dinner is not happening, um, there are still things happening at the church, and we invite you um, to come and participate in all of those things. Okay, I'm going to invite you to stand now, and we're going to worship God together this morning. Good morning, everybody. We're glad that you're here this morning. I think you know this one, so have a good time. You can uh, clap, and you'll have to sing extra loud, so I'm going to make you do that so you can help me out. But uh, we're excited to be here in the house of the Lord this morning to worship God.
that you're here to worship with us this morning, and I ask that you remain standing and join me as we join together in the call to worship. We're located up on the screen there. I'll read the regular print, and you'll respond with the bowl. Some of us come today with hearts weighed down with anxiety, fear, despair, and hurt. Together, we cling to this truth. Some of us come today with hearts that feel light with relief, joy, comfort, and gratitude. Together, we cling to this truth. Some of us come today not knowing what we think about God, confused and disappointed that the world God made is so full of evils of every kind. Together, we cling to this truth. Be with us, God, and all that we bring with us as we gather to encounter your unchanging love.
you may be seated. Megan?
God, we thank you for this day and this worship, the time to come and to be near to you in a very intentional way. Lord, we thank you for those who've given of themselves sacrificially and tithes and offerings and giving to you. The family of Israel bowed themselves in the song of the waiting as they get to it early in the morning and they were just about to wake up. So God, now as we approach your word, pray that you would open our hearts Today comes from Mark's Gospel. This is our lectionary text, and it's the third chapter, beginning with the 20th verse, which is weird because it's like in the middle of a sentence. And so typically we say 22, um, but really the sentence starts, Then he went home, talking about Jesus. And this is how the story unfolds. And the crowd came together, again, so that they could not even when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called to them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against him and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end will stop. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed that house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they said, He has an Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they spoke to him and called him. 
crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The word of God for us, the people of God, thanks be to God. Again, this is lectionary. I didn't choose this passage, okay? So as you heard it read, and you know all that's going on in the world, please do not think that I picked this in particular to talk about uh, the United Methodist Church. That'll come in time. I got a different message for today. Because I want to teach you just a little bit about Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel um, includes these stories, the way in which the Gospel writer has written, has includes stories that are called Martin Sandwiches. Martin Sandwiches. You, you see this most evident in the way in which the story is portrayed about Jesus healing Jairus' Jairus' daughter, as well as the woman who was suffering from hemorrhage. So the way that story transpires in Mark's Gospel is he finds out about the daughter. He starts to go. In the middle of that, he's interrupted. He heals. And then he continues on the original story. Right? So it's Mark and Sandwich looks like this. It's like a story starts. Then there's something in the middle. And then another. The story concludes. And the thing that's in the middle typically informs the whole. Right? The thing in the middle typically informs the whole. You don't call a sandwich by the bread most often. You call it by the meat that's in the middle. The last couple of weeks I've been thinking uh, and had the opportunity to tell some stories or tell a story about a sandwich in particular. Uh, so last week we were, uh, yeah, Chad knows where I'm going with this. Last week we were eating over here at Grouse's. Anybody go to Grouse's? You like Grouse's? SCC Dipper, that's my family, right? So, if you're from Columbia, though, you know that way back when, there was a feud in the sandwich industry in downtown Columbia named Indian Fire. And it happens that a man named Andy was working at Grouse's and decided he was going to leave and to start his own sandwich shop there in Five Points in Decatur, Georgia, today. And uh, students at USC had to choose. You were either a Groucho person or you were an Andy Deli person. And it just so happens that my parents were Andy people. They were Andy people. And so I started going at a very young age to Andy Deli, so young that I could hide under the counter from him. And I always ordered the same thing. It's not ham. It's a roast beef sandwich with a little bit of mayonnaise on white bread. And, and as I got older and I was above said counter, I started ordering it with double meat. Now, we went in there so very often that Andy knew me and my order. I worked in Columbia for a couple of summers, and I would just go by, I'd walk in, he'd see me in line, he would write my order up, and my sandwich would be ready when I got to pay for it. I never had to order. Now, here's the tricky thing. My taste buds over the years progressed a little bit. I desperately wanted something other than a roast beef sandwich, but Megan will vouch for it. While Andy was alive and working in that store, I never ordered anything else. Never ordered anything else. That was my sandwich story. Jesus, in this sandwich story from Mark, starts and ends with his family. But in the middle of this sandwich appears the scribes from Jerusalem. The scribes have come down from Jerusalem in order to talk to this rabble-rousing rabbi from the Galilee. 
because he's doing things that they're not used to seeing be done. And so it's this interaction that Jesus has with the sky that teach us a little bit about something as a whole. Right? So the scribes are the meat of this marking chain, and it teaches us and informs us a little bit about this whole scene. So what do we learn? A few things. First, status won't get you very far. Not in God's kingdom. You see, the scribes are learned men. They've done all the hard work to get where they are. They've supposedly done all the right things. They've checked all the right boxes. And yet, here they come down from on high, and they meet God on the living God who is in the presence of God. who come to him seeking to protect him, and yet even they get it wrong. Which leads to a second point. Jesus doesn't need defending. Let me say that again. Jesus doesn't need defending. do it work. You don't need to defend your faith. Jesus is engaged in that very act of defeating the satanic powers of this world. This is the reason he tells the story. This is the reason Jesus engages in the story that he tells in the form of a parable. He says that there's a strong man that's going to, and in order to plunder the, the, the house, you've got to tie up the strong man. Jesus can do the hard work with all the habit that sin and brokenness seek to establish in our lives and in the world around us has been, is being, and will be defeated by Jesus. No made-up theology that we can come up with changes Jesus. Jesus is who He is. God in the flesh. Our commentator, uh, Eugene Boring, puts it this way. Gospel is good news from the battlefield. I, I'm not a huge proponent of the militaristic, militaristic language that we sometimes use in the church, but I like this idea. I like this idea that the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that good news from the battlefield. Because there's a war being raged, and we don't even have to fight it. Jesus is fighting it. We just got to get in line. in battling the evil powers of this world and doesn't have time for our silly games. So much so that Jesus makes the statement that so many have focused on in the history of the church. And probably you, as I read it, thought to yourself, ooh, finally, somebody's going to explain this to me. Because this is one of the questions I get most often from people who do serious Bible reading. Serious Bible reading. Not just somebody who's listening to what the crowd's saying outside, but somebody who does serious, in depth Bible study will come to me and say, Brad, I don't understand this passage. Explain it to me. This is where Jesus says, Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, can never have forgiveness. It's not 
that they're not forgiven. It's just they can never have forgiveness, but it's guilty of an eternal sin. People come to me and they're like, that doesn't sound very Christ-like. And I'm like, I know. Maybe Mark's wrong. No. But maybe we're just not understanding it. This is oh, the way Eugene Peterson writes it in the message, which I love. It's a, it's a transliteration of the Bible. He takes the Bible and he, he sort of puts it in common language that we can understand. And, and most of it he gets right. There's a couple of things that kind of trip me up sometimes. sometimes. But, but this is what he says about this passage or how he writes this passage. Listen to this carefully, he has Peter say. I'm warning you. There's nothing done or said that can't be forgiven. But if you persist in your slanderous, your slanders against God's Holy Spirit, you are repudiating the very one who forgives, falling off the branch on which you are sitting severing by your own perversity all connection with the one who forgives. What is it again that we cut off from the way Christ says to us? Forgiveness. If you attribute the work of Jesus to the work of Satan, that's the unforgivable sin. If you have left no room for God to do what God is going to do, that's what Mark is saying. See, listen, we don't have to worry about blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. You know, because really, honestly, like, people come and they read this and they're, they're like, oh, what if I do this by accident? What if I accidentally blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? That's not how this works. Instead, we have to guard against the rigidity of believing that we have all the answers. Like said God. Maintaining this posture of humility, of holding things loose. Good Lord, I've been preaching this for 15 years. Holding things loose. I mean, admit to yourself, when things go haywire in your life, is the majority of the time not when you're white knuckling? Feel that? Like when your white knuckling is trying to control everything, and then all of a sudden something happens, and it's like, wait, who did I blame? We gotta allow God's Holy Spirit to move in ways that we do not anticipate. And listen, I can already hear a little bit of pushback in this. You know, Brad, like, you know, that's a slippery slope. Start going down that slope, you're going to slide off the mountain. But even though we're tethered to Jesus, we are tethered to Jesus. If we're going to keep that mentality of that the mountain climbing experience and you're worried about falling off, put a safety rope on Jesus, which means you spend time in His Word and then spend time in prayer. that there is nowhere we can go that Jesus has not, is not, and will not be. And our status describes and even of Jesus' family, but actions in response to the call of God in the person of Jesus Christ that marks what it means to belong to the Father. in this family are dynamic. They flow from the encounter and the experience and the response of Jesus. They're not checking boxes, not being related. They're active, living life together. When I was walking into that deli, South Carolina, and Andy, who stands behind the counter and calls everybody, my dear, if you're female, 
and my friend if you are not. You didn't call me that. You didn't call me my friend. You called me better. See, he got to know me well enough to know what I did for a living. And, and it just so happened that his grandson was the same age as my son. And so we, we sort of got to talk together. And any time I walked in the door, it was always hi, I didn't change my order because I didn't want to hurt his feelings. I didn't change my order because it was a part of our relationship. relationship with one another. And it was that meat, that first meat, that helped to remind me. It is the relationships that we are in. They are way, they are way more important. God who can know love and who loves I'm thankful that you call us to love us. That you love everything about us. And that you love us so much that you don't leave us alone. this next song with us to continue to worship uh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords.